Now let us talk about the Elitz poem, The Lost Song of Alfred J. Prufrock. The title itself suggests the irony of the poem. It's a love song. So what are you expecting when you are talking about a love song? So you expect a uh, amount of imagination, amount of romanticism, an amount of uh, uh, belief, a faith, and above all it can be sung. But when we go into the poem, we see how none of these elements are present in the poem. And what is the name of the protagonist? Proof Rock. Actually, it's, it, it connotes a prude in a frock. So when we see like, uh, when we read the novels of uh, like David Copperfield and all that, so we see that the characters have a different name which almost uh, denotes their character like Grand Grind you know, uh, Tiny Tom, so Tiny Tim. So these things like this, the name itself, the proof rock, indicates some emasculation, which is a part of a theme. Loss of heroism, which we are going to see. Now, how is this poem, which was written 100 years ago, is still relevant to us today? That's another question we are going to think about. So this poem was written in 1909 to 1910, started uh, when Eliot was a student in Harvard University and it was finished when he was touring uh, in Europe. And only later when uh, he met Elza Pound and showed it to him that Elza Pound was the editor of uh, a certain magazine, then he got it printed in that. So that's how it came into light. So when we go into the poem, we see that uh, this is reflecting the age in which it was written. It was after the industrial era which has started. And we see, like, just we go through the poem, we see the images, the theme, uh, the verse, the meter of the verse, all indicate the age in which it was written. And also, Eliot has uh, shown in his poem, through his poem, his idea, his criticism, uh, uh, beliefs in criticism. And he goes on to say in traditional individual talent that uh, a poet is not writing in isolation. A poet has the burden of all the tradition which has gone behind him. So he, the, the past can never be left behind and the past is very much a part of the present. So when a poet or an artist is writing, uh, he does have the influence of all the previous authors and their works on them. And we see, when we go into the poem, we see that there are so many works of art which we come to the, which we can think of it. And one more thing they say about Eliot is that he was uh, largely influenced by the French symbolists, uh, especially Fogg. Um, he goes on to say in one of his critical essays that he couldn't find an English uh, the, the rich criticism which is available in French. So in French, this he says they are less, uh, uh, they are more critical and uh, they are more detached from emotion. And that is what he tries to show in his poems. So Le Fog was, uh, Jules Le Fog was one of the major influences on Eliot. And we see how in the choice of themes and the expression of the idea or the emotion uh, Eliot is very much a detached artist, as of uh, just like his uh, French counterparts. Uh, let us go into the poem. So the epigraph of the poem, we have six lines, if you can see, six lines. These are from uh, Dante's Inferno. Inferno, Italian meaning hell. So now the uh, you see how a love song has a tour to hell. You know, the Dante is taken on a tour in the hell by Virgil and uh, this is the epigraph of the poem so the irony part of it is that uh, and uh, the purpose of taking through the hell is uh, to show what acts should not be committed and how sins can be avoided and also there is also a uh, message that you can never come out of a hell you have to go back to the hell again so this is, uh, it's about Canto 27 of Inferno, which is the epigraph of this poem. Now let us get into the poem. So if we go, uh, let, me, let me read the lines for you. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread again against the sky. Like a patient, it's upon a table. Let us go, 
through certain half deserted streets the muttering retreats the restless nights in one night cheap hotels and sordid restaurants with oyster shells streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question oh do not ask what is it let us go and make our visit in the room the women come and go talking of michelangelo so if we look at this poem we see it's, there is a dramatic opening let us go then you and i so these uh, these lines uh, often uh, uh, remind us of the dramatic monologues of robert browning uh, where there is an assumed speaker and uh, uh, most of the time the monologue reflects the character of the person who is speaking and elit himself has said about the poem that it was partly a dramatic creation of a man about 40 i should say and partly an expression of feeling of my own through this dim imaginary figure so proof frank is an imaginary figure in his 40s and uh, he is uh, calling out to someone that you and i so that you can be the reader it can be a woman and it can also mean the humanity when you you come to the end of the poem you realize you can be is a debatable uh, subject so let us go then you and i when the evening is spread against the sky so you see the images if we, if we count all the images we see they are like different from the earlier romantic period so it is not see the period the time is evening and they're going for a stroll obviously and evening is indicative of it's neither day nor night and it is also indicative probably of the impending death so night if we compare it to death it is uh, the middle that it's something like middle between life and death and here it is uh, the evening is sleeping it is not a natural sleep it is it's arised it's arised in the sense uh, it is uh, you know medically uh, it is given uh, some portion so that it is something it's ominous so it's not natural so the evening in that kind of evening so let us go like a patient is right so patient you know that shows the world is not healthy it's sick so it is a sick world where uh, the narrator or the first person narrator is going along with another person for a walk through half deserted streets muttering retreats and you have to also look at the images which follow see this is not a very nice thing to take your lover to like you know you have a de half deserted streets muttering the people are muttering and uh, there are a, there is a talk about one night cheap hotels and sordid restaurants with oyster shells so these are not uh, these are very sordid images and uh, there is a talk of culprits and prostitutes and uh, this is definitely not a place which a man would take his lover to so there is this and this also reflects the age where so if you see that uh, it's not like a verdurous glooms or you know soft incense upon the boughs and there is no that kind of the root singing in amidst the land you know there are those kind of images the flush green meadows or the flowers so the, these images are not uh, very much uh, present here so these are the images which are true to the industrialized society of the new england uh, where the des- the streets are half deserted and uh, there is not a f- it's sordid it's dirty and uh, it is not a very romantic thing to to take your lover to now there is also uh, i think like uh, the streets remind you of a tedious argument you see like uh, most of the poetry of eliot is like intellectual uh, when when we see the romantic poetry what did they say uh, poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility but here uh, there is less of imagination less of uh, powerful feelings but more of uh, thought process the intellect part so it's like a tedious argument and the intent is also not good so and, uh, and in this poem the poet is the, the speaker is 
uh, forcing himself to a crisis. Maybe he's asking an overwhelming question, which we see, we come to the end of the thing, we see that he's again and again going to ask this question. But does he ask the question? Does he bring himself, does he bring the courage, does he muster the courage to bring up that question, to force the crisis? So that we have to see towards the end of the poem. So then he's asking, so he, it comes to him, but later, later on he says, please do not ask, what is it? And there is this refrain, which is the woman come and go, talking of Michelangelo. So Michelangelo is not like, he's a, he's a very great Renaissance artist and of an epic grandeur. But the women in the room, uh, they talk it as it is, trivial matter. So things are, uh, uh, Michelangelo is not spoken to in a form of uh, the grandeur or the appreciation, but in a form of a chit chat by the woman uh, talking in just like that. They're just in a drawing room chit chat. So it becomes down to a drawing room chit chat. The next lines, uh, we have uh, use of conceits. So conceits were these, uh, especially used for the metaphysical poets, like when you are comparing to, uh, just to startle or to create a shock when you compare two almost unconnected things together to bring the thought and emotion together. So here also it uses conceits in the way of the metaphysical poets when he says, the yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muscle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from the chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and saying that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. Some of the critics also say that this yellow fog represents the law which Prufok is in search for. So, so the yellow fog and also there is allusion to a cat which goes to sleep. This also indicates the desire in the uh, first person uh, and his inability to time the desire. So this is, this is the images which evoke all these, the chimneys, the fog, uh, the window panes you know, drains. These are all again uh, the images uh, which create a sort of the industrial, uh, post-industrial revolution scenario of New England. And in the next lines we come to talk, uh, the, he, the person talks of time and death. So there is this, uh, uh, in all most of the tales it is poem Geronsian and uh, the Wasteland, which the later poems. There is this preoccupation with the death. So death seems, and uh, ironically, in the poem, in the love song, we have uh, a mention of time and death, which uh, haunt the poet. Uh, the indeed, uh, indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, uh, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face, to meet the faces that you meet. To prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Uh, this line indicates that the poet is not uh, the, the speaker uh, is actually talking of the lack of spontaneity in a modern man. So when you see Keats, uh, the poems of Keats or Shelley or Wordsworth, there was this spontaneous overflow. So when Keats saw a bird singing on a tree, it was just a moment. Uh, it's an evening and he just went there and he had that powerful uh, inspiration and he wrote it down. So it's an expression of spontaneity. So but here the uh, the speaker says there's no lack of spontaneity and he has to wear a mask. So you know, you prepare a face to meet the face. So there's this disguise, there is hiding and uh, it is, uh, a, there is a attempt to show some other uh, aspect of a human being which he is not. So there is mask of a on one thing that is that is applicable to much of the modern man who is not his true self and who is not spontaneous. So there will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time for it for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of 
toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. So this is a refrain which occurs in the poem. The women come and go, talking of Michelangelo, reflecting the triviality, the social conventions of that time. And also, there is we can see that there is this... Um, the thought process is not logical. Um, uh, this poem is known for its uh, fragmentation and juxtap juxtaposition. Like, you know, uh, you have these visions and revisions. And uh, also, there will be time to murder and create. So, these are the two opposite things, you know, murdering, you know, take the life out and create, giving a life. So, these two things, and there's a lot of time, like, according to him. And uh, it there's but there there is a time for hundred indecisions. So you can see throughout the poem how the poet uh, fails to make a decision, and uh, visions and revisions. So uh, how much time is spent on a vision, and again it is revised in no time. Uh, here also we see uh, we can uh, relate it to kids. Uh, yeah, was it a vision, a dream or reality? Do I dream? Or I'm awake or asleep? So you know that kind of a vision, or a poet, or a seer, or a mystic, who you know who goes and has this kind of uh, thing of a vision. He sees in his vision and he creates. But it is also followed by a revision. A modern man has time for revisions and indecisions, and to sit. They are actually literally saying sit upon the problem. You know that is kind of a th world and the person the speaker is. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my morning call, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie, rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare? Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. So this is uh, again showing the timidity of the speaker. And this uh, indecision is not only uh, reflected in a personal life but also in a universal level. He says, do I dare disturb the universe? So this kind of isolation, alienation, and uh, lack of confidence so he says like uh, he is so uh, conscious of his thin arms and legs so you know he's a man of 40 and he's very fastidious with his coat and his necktie and the pin and he's go going and uh, actually the, the, the initial name of this poem was a uh, proof rock among women so this is major uh, the major theme is how a 40 year old is in search of love and uh, is going amidst women and with this uh, lack of confidence and lack of decision lack uh, lack of the courage to bring up the overwhelming question whether maybe it's a marriage proposal or for a relation in which he fails because of this um, growing uh, timidity and luck uh, and uh, his isolation basically from the world and he Every time uh, the emotion comes up, the thought says, calm down. You know, you're not going to ask that question. For I have known them all till already, known them all. I have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with the dying fall beneath the music from a father room. So how should I presume? And I've known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I'm formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I'm pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the buttons of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, and that they braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. Is it perfumes from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl and should I then presume and how should I begin? Yes, uh, this is a famous line like uh, uh, which shows about how uh, so how my days are spent uh, uh, on the about so 
so here again the famous line uh, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons uh, see the time he has uh, is not only has a procrastination and he's also wasted his time in a futility futile endeavors and he has measured his life with coffee spoons and uh, and he's also talking about the attraction he feels towards the woman, uh, their uh, arms, which he could see. And also there's a, there's a, again, a juxtaposition of imagination and reality. And he feels he's like pinned on the wall and uh, has seen the, their bare arms. And, and he's also, he's digressed in his thoughts by the presence of this woman. Now shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of rugged clouds scuttling across the floors of silent seas. This is another important image of the modern era, if you know, the after it often uses, uh, later in his, so he's uh, actually, it's a scavenger, you know, crab, you know, it cleans the seas. So he wishes he was a, he could clean the milieu which he is found in and which he is not connected, which he fails to communicate. And afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers asleep, tired or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to, to its crisis. The, again, this overwhelming question, uh, his, the thought of uh, forcing the crisis. But, but do I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed? Do I have seen my head growing slightly bald, brought uh, in upon a platter? I'm no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and sneaker and in short I was afraid. Uh, here again there is uh, an illusion, uh, the, uh, talk of the prophet and uh, he was uh, he was put to death for ac not accepting love. But here, uh, here but the, the enormity of uh, there is no such enormity of the situation as in the case of the prophet. So he was not meant to be. He says, I was not meant to be. And it is not of a great matter that I denied love and I faced, I'm facing death. So the death is again, he, death is a eternal footman. It's just waiting. And he says that, and I'm no prophet. And I'm, and death is really waiting. me. But this death is not a grand death as that of the prophet. Uh, it is a very trivial one because I, uh, because I have never uh, had that, uh, you know, he's talking about the triviality of a modern man's life. Uh, there, there is no faith. He has lost connection. Uh, he has lost faith in the religion. And uh, in a larger sense, his life is pinned down to a very little thing in this universe. And would it have been worth it after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tree and the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all, if one setting a pillow by her head, should I say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. So again, um, we are reminded of uh, Andrew Marvel's poem to his coy mistress, uh, where he says, "Do I squeeze the universe into a ball?" So uh, he at once makes his dilemma, his doubt, his fears, uh, his vacillations into a universal level, and say. Uh, I am Lazarus. Lazarus, there are two Lazarus in uh, Christian uh, mythology where one is when uh, a person, uh, a beggar in front of the house of a rich man. When he dies, he is taken to heaven, whereas the rich man goes to hell. And uh, so, uh, speaking of the value of charity. So again, here he says, uh, I am uh, let us, I am not Lazarus and, uh, and come back from the dead. So, would it have been 
worth at all. So there is a uh, there is a vacillation to start at it and to actually raise the question. Or he's also thinking about the wor worthwhile. You know, is it worth? Is it the love? Is the life he's leading? Is the time he's spending? Is the death? Is it the worth of all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and dooryards and the sprinkled streets? After the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts, the trail along the floor, and this and so much more. Uh, it is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern through the nose in patterns on a screen would have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning towards the window should say, that is not at all, that is not what I meant at all. So that is again uh, a refrain which you see like women come and go talking of Michelangelo. You observe that there is a, uh, the poem is written in free verse, uh, but it's not that like it's without rhythm, but if there is an irregular rhythm, and uh, and there is this fragmentation of ideas, fragmentation of form, which is very typical of Eliot in expressing the his ideas. And again comes the here famous, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was I meant to be, and I am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress. Start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool. Differential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous. Full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. At times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. So he is comparing himself to a fool who is like a jester. You know? He is not a, serious in his vacation and uh, he is Hamletian, like to be or not to be. To bring the uh, question to a crisis, should I ask? Even if I ask, is it worthwhile? So, a lot of indecisions and vacillations in the mind of the speaker. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. So, this 40 year old man is again aware of his growing uh, age and uh, shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the earth. I have heard the men my singing, each to each. I do not think they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back. When the wind blows the water white and black, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till the human voices wake us and we drown. So uh, here there is a brief uh, escape into the world of imagination where he sees he's uh, in the sea and he's not amidst the sordid dirty lanes and the drawing rooms of modern society and he sees the mermaids and they could sing to him and it is this brief escape just like how uh, Keats realizes towards the end was it a vision you know fled is that music the fancy cannot fool you for long so and there is this uh, suddenly the voice of humans and he he is violently drawn back and we drown so here again the use of we indicates that he is indicating um, the whole humanity maybe not just he you and i and you know the reader or his lover or the woman maybe a woman or any companion who are uh, actually we see it started with going for a stroll in the evening and does it there is there a movement is there a movement at all so till and we drown so in the end does he ever put up the question and does he ever uh, he ultimately draws does he and this death so uh, actually uh, it's a portrait of failure or of a character who fails and it would be false art to make it end on a note of triumph. This is what Ezra Pound says about the poem. So he actually uh, supports that the way the poem ends is that if the man dies at the end, the speaker, and of all, after all his... Uh, so the end of the poem is again uh, shows how the speaker fails to find love or does he actually work towards it and finally he's going for creativity, life, beauty, aesthetics amidst looking for all of them amidst the gross realities of modern life, uh, urban life especially. It's not a rural life, it's an urban life uh, full of dirt and you know culprits and uh, indecisions 
uh, loss of faith, loss of communication. You know, most of the time the speaker tries, is it worthwhile? Is it, uh, can she actually uh, understand what, uh, what I say? So most of the time these indecisions, the vacillations and you know, the doubts, the fear, the fear that you will be judged, the fear that you will be not understood, the fear that you will never get love. So all these fears and uh, doubts and are at the end. So he can't like, he can't fancy for long with the mermaids which indicate life. So and uh, he's awakened violently to the reality through the human voices. So this is how uh, it's a psychological and a sociological, you know, uh, and aesthetic journey of the person through the poem which we can see so it's the love song of Alfred J. Prufrock which is uh, now we can say it's a very ironic you know the ironic way or the ironic theme the ironic person the Prufrock uh, who is emasculated and he he feels maybe he's uh, inefficient impotent to you know force the crisis so whatever he's talking about and finally he ends up in death so there is this preoccupation uh, with the waste of time and you know waste and uh, growing age which again sees in Geronshin and finally the death the preoccupation obsession with the death we see in uh, Wesley so this is how the poem gives a glimpse of the modern man which is very true to even till today and uh, no doubt he got a Nobel Prize thank you